Hey folks, Dr. Mike here for the Making Progress channel. Today's video number 37 in our hopefully for a long time series is the coming robotics revolution. We're starting to get some really cool developments and um, this to me is a presentation that can do two things. The very minor one is for me to look back on this eight years from now and be like, see, I told you guys. It's like, Maybe in the year 2000, you you made a presentation that was the, the coming smartphone revolution and everyone was like, what are you talking about? And then boom, the iPhone and then Android and like, oh, I guess you had, had this coming. Obviously, it's for bullshit ego points no one cares about. But I really do want to get you folks that watch the videos to start early to wrap your heads around the near inevitability of what is going to happen. And I'm going to kind of describe to you sort of what's required for the robotics revolution, what is the robotics revolution, can it get you just intellectually two things. One, prepare to expect the stuff and whatever decisions you need to make about what your career you pick, what life trajectory, blah, 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 but also have an understanding that when this starts happening and traditional news media especially starts to, as they just whatever earns them more money, start to scaremonger and do all this other stupid shit, um, you'll look back on this and be like, you know what, N none of this is really crazy, wild, unpredictable stuff. It's more like inevitable rather than predictable. It's like when people like were starting the internet, the internet was really growing. People said, you know, like computer viruses, they're going to affect the whole world. They're going to kill us all. This is bad. And now we know that that was maybe one of the stupidest things people could have ever said, but you never can quite tell the difference between scaremongering and a legitimate concern and just pure, utter, unabashed stupidity. And I, I want to get you guys a little more familiar with the space. And look, I'm a dilettante in the space. Fuck if I know what I'm talking about, but I know a little bit more than the average news anchor. No, I take that back. 10 times more than the average news anchor about this kind of stuff. So if you kind of um, at least give uh, these ideas some thought, you'll be better prepared for when cool revolutionary tech comes out in a few years, five years, 10 years, you'll be able to be like, oh yeah, that, that makes sense. You know, if you um, really paid attention in the mid nineties, all of the internet and social media stuff that came out afterwards, you were like, well, yeah, that makes sense. Like when Facebook came out and it's like, look, it's just like a web page that connects people and you put up your pictures and like talk to each other. No one was like, oh my fucking God, this is a revolution. Really? But it ended up being a revolution because it connected so much of the whole world, but nothing about it was like, oh, wow, there's, there's no way they're going to be able to make this happen, right? So this is my spiel on robotics because robotics is one of those things that all of us who grew up watching uh, sci-fi movies there's always fucking robots, right? Not always. Very often robots. And now we have the internet. We have AI. We have large language models. We talk to computers like they're real. And we have life-saving medicine, super crazy DNA technology. But where the fuck are the robots? And I'm here to tell you they're coming. They're coming and they are inevitable. And no, they won't have laser guns and be skull-shaped and uh, nuke Los Angeles. Sorry, John Connor. All right. Seven things to talk about. First, I'm going to talk about what universal robotics is. So I'm going to define it as universal robotics. Second, I'm going to talk about why it's such a big deal. Third, I'm going to talk about the primary five or six puzzle pieces that are required as technology uh, evolutions, as technology demonstrations, as technology capabilities to actually make universal robots. And one of the reasons we don't have robots walking around yet is because not all of these pieces have been really pushed to the fore and mature, some of them have just been completely absent for the entire 2000 through 2010 through 2020. They just weren't around. Now they're really starting to come around. So it's very exciting to talk about. Number four, I'll talk about how far off each puzzle piece is. Once they're all in the mix, uh, robotics is essentially inevitable. Next, I'll talk about why digital only uh, artificial general intelligence, which we're nearing r rapidly here with all the different la large language models we have, why, why this development uh, will speed things up considerably. And after that, I'm going to speculate a little bit about how universal robotics, its arrival and its maturation, kind of like, you know, like the everyone has a, a smartphone kind of thing. Now we just take totally for granted. Like you go to a village in Africa and like most of the people have a smartphone. You're like, huh. Well, there's no way that affects their lives. Like, no, it greatly affects their lives. It affects the whole world. When most people have access to universal robotics, this is going to change society in a couple of ways that are quite predictable and in many other ways that are not. Obviously, I can't predict the unpredictable ways, but I will predict the predictable ones. So to give you a kind of lay of the land of what you can expect in the future. And um, lastly, I'll do some timeline predictions, which are very, very hazy and potential stumbling blocks of how this technology could maybe not come to be used uh, as soon as folks like me, psychotic futurists, would like. All right, so 
what is Universal Robotics? Other than I think the company name of the company that made the robots in uh, uh, Scott Video Guy. What's that one movie with Will Smith? Uh, iRobot. iRobot. I think that was the name of the company. It was a very good name. Um, I like the term Universal Robotics. There are many other names for it. Uh, to me, the way I define Universal Robot is a robot that can do nearly all or even all human jobs. And it's likely going to be a humanoid design because our world is designed for humans. Now, there's going to be tons and tons of robots that are made over the next 10 years and launched into their own production lines, and you're going to see them everywhere that aren't humanoid shaped. Because like, if you need a robot to like go into pipes and clean the pipes, because it's not going to be a fucking human. How the hell do you fit a human being into an eight foot long pipe and the, the seal broke eight feet in? Uh, this is not going to happen. Um, but there's going to be a lot of humanoid robots, but also other shaped robots for sure. And when I say all or even all human jobs, I'm talking about things like uh, maybe especially physical things like cooking, welding, gardening. There are no robots that really do this on Moss today. There are not even really demonstration robots, especially like in cooking, there's a little bit, but they really just only make one thing. Like there's an ice cream maker robot, but there's not a robot you can say like, hey, I want scrambled eggs and I want hash browns and I want that toast, but I want it like sort of medium and not super well. There's not a robot that can do all of those things yet. Universal robot will be able to do all of them just as if you're talking to a human being. And because what human beings have, if you take a look at a person, just a human, maybe they're even they're in front of you in their underwear, and you go, okay, which guy's the shipbuilder? Which guy's the doctor? Which guy is the carpenter? You almost will never be able to tell. I mean, outside of cultural cues, like eh, the guy with the beard is definitely a shipbuilder. Like, nope, that's a doctor. Oh, God damn it. The nerdy guy, carpenter, fuck, I got it wrong again. But there's nothing really phenotypically different about humans in the modern world because we use machines so much. Like a shipbuilder doesn't really pick up a ship and put it here, or pick up a huge I-beam and put it here. There's machine assistance for all of that. So robots that are specialized uh, or, or generalist robots that are not specialized, they can do a wide range of human tasks. It, really, the difference between a robot being a carpenter and a welder or a doctor is going to be software. And we already know that software is exponentially increasing in power and software updates are insanely easy to do. Like your universal robot would just plug himself into the wall chill there for two hours, fill up his power levels, and get updates from Apple or Tesla, whoever makes the robots. And then he gets up off the wall and you're like, hey, did you download that ability to give me a massage? And he's like, sure did. Got every single massage technique from all of time. Ready? And you're like, dude, this is the greatest thing that's ever happened. Then he kills you. You guys know the rest. But in any case, it's software that's going to be different, but the physical architecture can be largely the same, modeled essentially on a human. What this means is that every one of these robots becomes a universal worker. It can do nearly any job, nearly because some jobs will be reserved almost exclusively for humans until later in the game when shit gets really wacky. I'll talk about that too. Lastly, a critical component of universal robotics. This is one of the things, universal here means two things. Universal means it can do sort of all human jobs or nearly all of them, but universal also means it has near universal access, right? Um, your smartphone is universal because it can do anything an app can do, which is a ton of shit. It can play music. It can do talk to type. You can watch videos on it. I mean, it works as a GPS. I mean, all these in, new things used to be individual things. But you bought a radio and you bought, uh, uh, you know, a, a GPS tracker and you bought all this. Now it's just one device, right? So a part of the universality of cell phones is that like they're everywhere because they're fucking cheap. Like if just the rich guy had a smartphone, it'd be like, yeah, that's not really universal, right? It can do cool stuff, but where the fuck are the rest of them? Uh, when the fuck are the rest of us going to get it? So for me, one of the definitions of universal robotics or where we kind of cleared that threshold or getting close to it is when it's priced at a similar time price as modern high-end iPhone or in that same order of magnitude. So for example, as soon as universal robots, like a humanoid robot that can do most human tasks, um, can be uh, operated, purchased and operated over the course of its lifespan for under $1,000 a month, they're going to begin to spread to nearly all parts of society because now you have a universal worker that only costs $1,000 a month. That's $12,000 a year. That's below the United States minimum wage. That's really, really cool. And a lot of people who are currently sitting on their hands and waiting for people to fucking read their ads in the paper because nobody fucking – we're at yearly, year on year in the United States and a lot of the world – employment deficits. It's the opposite of unemployment. There are hundreds of thousands of jobs every month that just go literally unfilled and thus undone because there's no one to do them. So as soon as a robot costs like $1,000 a month, oh my fucking God, Chipotle, Subway, all the restaurants, gas station, et cetera, you're going to see robots everywhere because it makes sense. Now, eventually, my prediction is that the price may approach something like $100 a month. 
then nearly all humans will have direct help with almost everything they need. And I'll get to the implications of that in a bit, but they're really fucking wacky. And remember, something I think it may, if you are sort of a more consistent channel viewer, this futurism bullshit that I talk about every now and again, remember one thing, uh, I don't want to be pedantic, remember this, I highly recommend you keep one thing in mind for all futurism type of shit. It is the following idea. It is the idea that things you take for granted completely today were in yesteryear, at some point exotic and expensive, and at some point before that, barely imaginable, and at some point before that, just nonsense, magic, psychopathy, where you're like, dude, no one's going to be that rich. Are you out of your fucking mind? So when I say that in the year 2035, 2038, most people will have multiple robots at their beck and call to do everything they need. It sounds like nonsense. But right now, you may be nodding along, watching this on your phone and be like, that's nonsense. While you're streaming gigabytes of digital content per minute for a nominal price from everywhere in the world, and you're connected to the rest of humanity in a huge fraction of all human knowledge. What the fuck? Tell someone in the 50s that to be like, you're a fucking idiot, man. That's like going to happen in the year 3000 or some shit. It's not going to happen in, well, when did that happen? 2008, <laughs> 2006, something like that. Wild. So this seems wild to us now, but I will try to demonstrate that it is much more inevitable than it is crazy. And just like with cell phones, competition and innovation will drive this revolution like crazy. It's not just a matter of, oh, we get pretty cool robots and that's it. That's the new life. It's the robots are going to be getting better and better and better and better at every conceivable part of their tasks. Why? Oh, well, Mike the Capitalist coming out because people like Elon Musk, people like Sam Altman and all the people that make the corporations work, they want better for humanity, which is awesome. But also a lot of these folks, maybe not these folks specifically, but the rest of the people that work under them, they're greedy as fuck. They want more and more and more money. And the only way they're going to get more money out of you in a civilized world where you rationally exchange money for value is they're going to have to make the robots fucking good, okay? There's a reason that Apple engineers spend an inordinate amount of time and a ton of years off their lives trying to make the phone a little bit smaller, a little bit better display, a little bit better sound, works with the headphones better. It's because if you don't make it better, somebody else will. And then all of a sudden, people are buying the Samsung Galaxy and everyone forgot about the fucking iPhone. Competition and innovation are going to make this shit so fucking crazy and they're going to do it fast. So... Why is this such a big deal? I'll give you at least one story for that. And it's a bigger deal in about 100,000 other ways that I'll talk about uh, shortly when we're talking about the implications of what this revolution could unfold for us. Even radical artificial general intelligence, even artificial super intelligence, with no embodiment, that means it has no body to operate. It lives inside of your fucking PC or in front of, it lives inside of a server room in Montana that OpenAI operates and it just uh, APIs to your computer, but it, it doesn't leave the computer. It can't physically alter anything in the world. Uh, that AGI with no embodiment is super limited because of the fact that so many things occur in the physical world. For example, like, okay, so, okay, we have AGI. Let's say it's 2029, the predicted year on average now. Ray Kurzweil did this in 1990. He's smarter than the rest of us. Now, most computer scientists and folks like that say, yeah, 2029 looks like about the, an average time where artificial general intelligence will be surpassed and start to become artificial super intelligence. Okay, that means a computer can think of anything you can think of, or not you specifically, but can think like a human and do all kinds of human tasks. That's going to be fucking dope because office tasks are now just, just tell a computer to do it. It just doesn't. You may be a boss now of 10 computers that one of them is in charge of your marketing, one's in charge of your branding, one is in charge of, um, you know, uh, helping, you know, take the uploaded files from your computer and edit them and all this other stuff. Whatever it is you do for a living, office work is now with arrival of AGI. I don't want to say a solve problem, but like like a plug and play, like in and out. For example, uh, if you have a headache, you just buy Tylenol, you take it, and the headache goes away. If you have an office job that needs to be done, you just talk to AGI and it gets it done. It's crazy. It's coming, right? And that's a huge, huge deal. However, if we have this on your computer, these office machines that can, can do all the office work, that's amazing. However, however, I'm still cooking my own food. Fuck that. I'm still phoning my own fucking laundry. You guys. How do I put this in a way that isn't a cocksucker move? I've been very successful in my life so far, very fortunate. Money's not a problem. I still fold my own laundry. You say, dude, Dr. Mike, you got millions and shit, right? Yeah. Hire someone to do it. Where? 
where the fuck are we live in the metro metro Detroit? There's nobody around. Everyone's already gainfully employed. We don't even have employees to go to fucking I could go to Chipotle. It's closed half the time. There's not enough high school kids to run it. There is no one for me to hire. My wife already has a job. I'm folding my own fucking laundry. Now, do, is that insulting? No, I like folding my own laundry. It's it's like a kind of meditative thing. It's a peaceful thing. But like you guys probably all have slightly better marginal uses of your time than folding your laundry and washing your dishes and all that fucking stupid shit. I'm I'm doing that all by myself at this point. What the fuck? Right? Shipbuilding takes 10 times as long as it should because every year in the United States, there's just not enough shipbuilders. How many people do you know go into shipbuilding? By the way, if you want to go into shipbuilding, you can get an internship, an apprenticeship where they teach you how to be a ship welder. They pay you money, an amazing wage, totally covers living expenses. You can save a bunch of money too and have a great life just to learn how to ship build. And then eventually when you learn, they pay you even more money to do ship building. But so few people want that kind of work. It's tough work. It's not for everyone. And there's just not that many people. Someone's like, hey, you can work in the social media department of a clothing store. You sit in an air-conditioned office for six hours at a time. You just talk to your friends. You post, you share, you do some color grading. And it's, it's really fun. And then you get tons of money. Or you can go into fucking Louisiana and have to fucking live down there and build ships and rappel up and down a fucking 80 knot winds and all this fucking bullshit. You have a welder. Some people, manly motherfuckers, and well, while I'm being honest, shitload of lesbians, love that kind of work. But there's just not enough people to do that. And everyone else is doing all kinds of other bullshit. We're getting so wealthy, and this is an amazing thing as a society, that the demand, that is, you have money and you're ready and able and willing to pay for services, is doing this. And the supply of labor is doing this because there's just not enough people, right? Plain and simple. So shipbuilding takes 10 times as long as it needs to because there's just no fucking people around. In the real world, there are other challenges. I'm still aging. I don't have cool body composition drugs to take. I don't have cool nootropics to take because nobody's working that because there's not enough fucking people around. And this is physical stuff in the real world. We need robots mixing beakers and shit. We need robots putting in samples. We need robots injecting rafts with shit like that. There's just not enough people to do this stuff. So in essence, artificial general intelligence, some of its biggest impacts must also be real physical world impacts. Uh, I think uh, Peter Thiel or somebody else kind of wrote this blog post a while back called like we we wanted flying cars or some shit like that. It was like we wanted like trips to Mars and flying cars, but we got 140 characters instead. It was like Twitter came first. The hilarious irony of that is all of the data that social media interactions have created have been mined by companies like OpenAI. And now we have computers that understand and think and talk like people. And now they're going to build us flying cars. However, we still don't got flying cars, right? And so for AGI, artificial general intelligence to deliver on its full promise, man, we need some goddamn robot bodies for it to act in the world. And, and then really cool shit happens. Now, as far as I can tell, there are six primary puzzle pieces for universal robotics. One is artificial general intelligence. I mean, the robot needs to be smart, right? Otherwise, when you're like, hey, can you do the dishes? It's like, do not understand command. You're like, okay, great. That thing sucks. Next is motor control. It's got to be able to move around and take dishes and put them from here to there. Obvious. Another one is energy systems. Up until recently, this wasn't a thing. So you need a battery. And I'll get to a more technical discussion in just a sec. Like, you need to move the fucking robot around. and it needs to be able to move its limbs and needs to be able to not run out of charge every 30 seconds. Another one is skins. This one is a very low tier. We can have full-blown, full-blown, nearly full-blown universal robotics without ha robots having any skins whatsoever. If it just looks like the Tesla bot, like a, like a clank piece of metal machinery, it's going to be able to do your laundry and mow your lawn just fine. Now, if you want a different kind of interaction with robots, I'll begin to that in just a second. <laughs> you know what I'm talking about. It's not just sex, but also sex. Then um, skins are important. And, and especially when you have robots in a bunch of different contexts, like let's say Delta Airlines wants to hire some robots to do front of front counter work because they just don't have enough humans to do the job. Well, all of a sudden, you know, you can talk to a thing that looks like a tin can, right? But Delta Airlines might be like, hey, uh, open AI, thanks for making all these robots. Um, can you make any that like kind of look like people? And I know there's an uncanny valley situation, but kids are scared of these things. Can you make a robot look like a panda or something? And they're going to be like, well, yeah, we sure should look into that. The consumer demand for skins is going to be the big thing. It's not a mandatory thing, but it's going to be a thing. 
and also for, well, uh, just quite frankly, having relationships with your robots and, well, doing the sex with them. Yeah, you know, like I'm not, the Tesla robot doesn't exactly get me going. Uh, so we need something that looks like a human being in order to get that, that part. Small part, but nonetheless worth mentioning. The fifth component that's necessary is human vetting. Humans have to vet these robots. You can't just put robots out in the wild and be like, oh, like I gave my, uh, you know, the robot, the dog to dry and it, it ripped the dog into pieces by accident. Oops, like that's not a non-starter. So humans have to vet these robots. Humans have to feel safe. They have to trust the robots and there has to be just unreal, ungodly number of hours of robots, either completely or nearly accident free for people to be like, okay, Okay, fine. And less people, because a lot of people want them anyway. They know humans are way more dangerous than robots by a long shot, but uh, governments, regulatory agencies of various kinds, uh, unless robots are very, very safe, very well vetted by humans, they're just not going to let you have one, plain and simple. And lastly, and uh, majorly, is mass production. Because if you make a demonstration robot, hey, that's really cool, but it costs like $16 million to make the fucking thing. And to make another one, it costs you also $16 million because you've never scaled anything. And so mass production has to be a big factor. So let's talk about all these and, and see uh, what's going on uh, a little bit more specifically. So first, AGI, or in this case, we call multimodal AGI. Multimodal, multimodal artificial general intelligence means robots can touch, they can hear, they can see, they can talk, the whole fucking gamut. You know, we'll save taste for another time. Maybe they should be able to taste if they're creating recipes for you, but maybe if the recipes are good enough and human vetted, then the robot doesn't need to taste them. It just follows the recipe specifically. What is required for multimodal, multimodal AGI is a couple of things, at least three. Now, this, these are not complete lists probably, I don't think. I'm not an expert in this, but they're well on their way. One is the logical architecture, like the GPT somehow talks to you like it's a human because of the way it's built. So that is already kind of very close to solve problems. It's not quite AGI, but it's accelerating so fast that we're not really worried about that. Another one is compute capacity. I mean, like you're going to ask your robot to do a lot of local tasks. Like if you ask it something and you want an answer right away, it's not going to be able to, in all situations, ping the question back to the huge databases and get it back. So you're going to want a lot of local compute. And it takes a lot of compute to move a human-like body around in athletic ways, um, in smooth ways, and, and realize, like, look at a room and count and measure and track every single object and know what it is. Like, you need a lot of local compute for that. So that's a thing that, you know, NVIDIA is crushing that. Tons of other companies are crushing it. I'll talk a little bit about where we are with these things, but that's definitely a requirement. Another one is network network throughput. Um, robots are going to network. They're going to network with each other. They're going to network with your home. They're going to network with your phone or whatever replaces the phone, like the headset. And then they're network back to their old company, to, uh, in the robotics company, to get updates and stuff. The, the data volumes of universal robotics are going to be fucking massive. So network throughput has to be a thing. Like it, it, It's not going to be 5G. It's going to be like 8G or some shit like that. You guys get my drift. Next is the task of motor control. There are a couple of different kinds of motor control. There's gross motor control. Can you do this? Right? There's fine motor control. Can you do this? Can you move your hands really quickly? Can you show your fingers? Can you, you take a pen, pick up a pen and do calligraphy? That's fine motor control. There is the question of servo mechanisms. So if a robot is going to give you a massage, it has to perceive how hard it's pushing and how hard the tissue is pushing back and have a, a rapid feedback mechanism there so that the robot's not like, I will give you a back massage. And it just takes its robot thumbs and pierces your spinal erection. You're like, fuck. It's like, is that deep tissue enough? You're like, actually, that feels great. So you can't have that. So force grading based on sensory feedback, really, really important. Not just for having sex with your robot, although it's really important there, but you know, like robots doing surgery, robots cooking. For the love of God, you can't get a robot to pick up an egg if it just goes crunch. You're like, okay, well, clearly it moves around really well, but it can't sense anything. Bad news. And of course, for motor control, execution speed and reaction speed, especially reaction speed is a big deal. Uh, a real world situation, right? One, uh, a, Chip a Chipotle human worker and three robot workers, human worker bumps into the robot if the robot's like, uh-oh, and like C-3PO, it just falls over. It's a non-starter. You need the robot to be able to real quick, make the adjustments, and it's good to go. And the, the, you know, this is tough stuff. This is stuff that until recently, we really couldn't get a handle on. Next, energy systems uh, uh, is a couple of things to talk about there. One is uh, local torque capacity. So like if you want a robot to mow your lawn, it had better be able to push with its legs uh, hard enough to push a lawnmower. If it can't do that, bad news. You want a robot to take out the garbage, but it does this to the garbage container, go, ooh, ooh, insufficient force. Like, okay, well, I can do that. What the fuck? You guys built this thing wrong. So robots are going to have to be about as strong as humans. 
my argument is always, you know, stronger is better, but, um, you know, at least on the scale of strength for humans, right? Even if it's just kind of a weak human, um, we're really getting started, right? Should be able to like uh, take a big bag of sugar from, uh, uh, you know, the cart and put it into the grocery store shelf or vice versa. If it can't do that, bad start. Next is the central power supply. Uh, that means how much total power does the robot have? And that's not just how much total force it can produce, but also ratioed to its weight. So you make a really, really strong robot that weighs two tons, but strength per ton is really shit. And then it doesn't accomplish a lot of really good things. If you want a robot to like convincingly, like easily fluidly walk upstairs, walk down a hill, you're going to have a really good central power supply. And lastly, integrated with a power supply is the concept of energy charge. There's a total energy charge, which means like how much, uh, how many hours of operation does your robot have with, with uh, one charge? Another one is weight ratio. If the battery pack weighs 60 fucking pounds, it's a bad deal because the robot has to work most of its time to just offload the battery pack. But if the battery pack weighs 20 pounds, now we're in fucking business. Another one is recharge accessibility. If the robot need can only be plugged in to its custom charging station at home, very limited use case. Although tons of use cases, home and business, that's great. But if you want to take your robot on a camping trip to have it set up the tent and watch out for predators or some shit like that, you're going to need a better recharge accessibility. So that's a technological thing. And lastly is recharge speed. Like there are many use cases where if the robot takes all night to recharge, no big deal because it's fucking nighttime, right? But if you wake up and your husband's having a heart attack in the middle of the night and you're like, you know, robot, help us get to the hospital. He's like, I am not charged yet. And it just goes back to sleep. You're like, okay, fucking Larry's going to die. Great thing. Fucking God. So the faster you can recharge, the better, the more use cases there are, so on and so forth. How fast do humans recharge? Well, actually, humans technically need a whole night of sleep. If you don't give humans sleep for a while, they eventually break down and they need food and they need uh, three meals a day, sleep, fluids, They humans poop, all this other stuff. That's part of the recharging process. So if we can do at least better than that for a robot, or we're really winning. If we could do 10x better than that, if for every 23 hours of operation, the robot needs one hour of charge time, holy shit, we're entering a totally new world. Skins. Real quick, so I'm not going to get too much into this way outside of even my dilettante area, but things like uh, facial expressions, sounds, and voices. I mean, there's totally a use case for like the, the Tesla robot, like flat screen with even no visual display, no red eyes or anything, but it like talks to you, but is it talking to me? It can definitely hear you and stuff like that, but I think – uh, there are a couple of demonstration robots currently that have some like facial expressions they can do, and they're a little bit creepy, but kind of pretty convincing. If that skips over the Uncanny Valley line, just for folks that don't know, Uncanny Valley is this really interesting thing in um, humanoid robotics and, and, and also animation and a couple other things where um, – if something looks not remotely like a human, but it has human features, like a teddy bear, you're like, oh, it looks nice. If something looks exactly like a human, you're like, that's a human. It looks great. But if something looks really close to a human, but not quite, it looks eerie to most people. That's why it's called you know, uncanny resemblance, uncanny valley. It's just like how you perceive a robot to look. You're like, great, better, better. Holy shit, that looks weird. And then back up to perfect, right? So if... And when, uh, not if, I take that back, when they break through uncanny valley with robotic architecture for faces and stuff, I mean, holy fucking shit, bro. You might not be able to tell who's a robot and he's a human just walking around the street, which would be a really, really awesome thing. Of course, literal skins, like if you're trying to do interesting things with your robot, I'll get to in a second, it has to feel at least somewhat like a human thing. Body shapes, you know what I'm saying? Like, are we talking about and if, I, if I'm trying to have sex with a robot, I don't want it shaped like the Tesla bot. Believe it or not, that's not what get my rocks off. And are we talking about developing subskin human feel tissues? So like, you know, like real talk, if I'm getting a sex robot, I, I, I want it to look like humanoid, very humanoid. I want it to have skin that feels like human skin. I want its body shape to be of that of a female of reproductive age. And when I grab its robot ass, I want it to squish, squish, squish like a, a female's ass. If it's like, oh man, this robot looks so great. And I touch the ass and it's like, clink, 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 clink. I'm like, okay, that's a fucking toaster. That's not going to work. Again, the skins thing of all of the work that humans do, sex work, 
not imp- super important in the grand scheme. So universal robotics can really arrive before any of the skin stuff. However, because the demand for interacting with robots in more and more human-like ways is going to be exponential, and the amount of money people will be willing to pay corporations to make them robots that look more and more human is going to be fucking constant and massive is going to happen and is not going to take very long. Next, human vetting. Really simple. Is it safe? Uh, uh, and it, or does it work collaboratively with humans? The, the real question here is how much vetting needs to occur for regulatory approval for mass use? The answer is a lot. But and when you have tens of thousands of test cases in factories and, and, and limited exploration, you know, robots con- conducting traffic, robots working in police stations, um, relatively high-risk environments anyway, once robots clear like 10 trillion hours of our operation where only one time a robot hurt someone by total accident, you're going to have regulatory pressure to be like, they're ready to go into people's homes. And obviously, there's another thing where people can sign a waiver and say, I want to test this robot at home. Company's not liable for anything fucked up that happens. I just need one now. God damn it. I don't care about safety. Some countries, some areas of the world will start doing that. Everyone gets jealous and then the regulatory bodies have to pass it because if it's going to be getting to a point where if your country doesn't have robots in it, no one's going to want to be in your country anymore. Be like, but they have all, they all have, each person has five servants in Sweden with the five fucking robots. Why don't I get that? Like, well, we didn't, they're not so safe. Like really the Swedish people, they they like danger or something. It's not going to pass. So uh, it's also easy to log tons of hours. Robots will communicate uh, in a network style. So when one robot learns something or how not to do something that's unsafe, every robot in that network will learn it. Every robot in the company will learn it. And so just like Tesla's driverless software development, it's easy to log a ton of hours. This is not going to be a thing where like, well, in order to make sure robots are safe, we're going to need to test them for 100 years. And to that point, you can test robots in a bunch of different scenarios in simulated environments. And uh, NVIDIA is doing some of the early work where they simulated real physics pretty well in an open environment, they can do a ton of robot testing in environment. And that means they can test uh, a single given robot software architecture like at 1,000 times normal speed. And because every time the architecture updates its ability to do something or learn something or move from the simulated physical world, every robot ever produced gets that software update and now knows that, the amount of wisdom you can develop in robot movement and thus making it safe and approved for human use is wild. So I do not anticipate this to be a problem. Lastly is the hurdle of mass production and very related mass maintenance. Robots will break. Who's going to fucking fix them? Robot can only fix so much of its own self. I'm sure they'll do plenty of their own fixing. But look, it's, it's, there's going to be a huge architecture around mass producing robots, trading in older robots, um, software updates, hardware updates, And of course, when things go wrong, you're going to need robot maintenance. Huge, huge thing. That mass production thing is a big deal. I'll talk about in a little bit how that hurdle can be surmounted. All right. Real, actually not too long of a conversation here. How far off is each of these puzzle pieces? Multimodal AGI is predicted to be uh, 2029 is is when we cross into ASI. It's on track. It's actually ahead of schedule seemingly. Um, If we now have multimodal AGI operating in Google and a couple other test platforms, you can look at YouTube videos of robots that can see, speak to humans, understand the physical world. They're all large language model based, so they know all the facts of history and all this other stuff. So that looks like to be a a five-year problem, if not less. Energy systems, real close. We're basically there, uh, but energy systems are improving rapidly over time. So within that five-year time horizon, energy systems should be well in to make robots that, at the very least, uh, or very worst, take eight hours of charging for every 16 hours of operation, and then they have a day-night cycle like humans, and then a lot of human tasks are knocked out of the park. Motor control, gross motor control, the best company in the world that does that currently is Boston Dynamics. And fine motor control, there's uh, figure robotics, and uh, Tesla has some really cool stuff where they're manipulating really, really small objects. Within five years, I anticipate motor control to be essentially a solved problem in robotics. Most of it's solved already. Interestingly enough, we weren't able to say this even five years ago. Robots were insanely clumsy, but as happens with accelerated exponential technological innovation, the shit is impossible today, reasonable tomorrow, the day after it's mundane, and the day after that, it day, I'm being facetious here, but a couple of years after that, it's like, uh, oh yeah, man, this isn't even very impressive. Skins, again, the note here is not essential for most tasks. Uh, but also not terribly technically difficult to develop because it's a surface level feature and a purely cosmetic feature. They already have a a lot of um, skins they can make that maybe don't feel like human skin, but that's fucking close enough. And this isn't um, a technology sector that's going to develop much in my view until universal robotics is 
on its way to having well universal adoption. And then the use cases of like, well, we need robots that look like people, feel like people, et cetera, comes up. And then you're going to see a bunch of billion dollar valuations for companies that specialize in making robot tissues that feel like humans, blah, 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 blah. This isn't going to take that long. And also, I did put a special note to this uh, or a little asterisk next to my notes. It's not essential for you true, what I would say, the real core of universal robotics, right? You don't need the Chipotle robot to have human fucking skin. If you're going to take it home later, you need it to have human skin, but that's a very small part of what robots uh, bring as far as value to society. Human vetting. Human vetting is a thing that like is already occurring. Um, there is not a single robotics company whose probably number one concern isn't to keep the robots safe. If you're sitting on a $1 trillion robotics company and your robots hurt people, you're now sitting on a uh, probably too low a value to give it a dollar amount, whatever you can sell the factories to for scrap value of company. Uh, everyone in, in robotics industry knows this. The priority for human vetting and safety is insanely high. And that's one of these things that probably will develop just alongside as robots develop technologically. I don't think this is going to be a huge stumbling blocks unless regulatory stuff gets in the way. I'll talk about that at the end of this chat. Mass production is clearly not here because we don't even have fucking fully functional universal robots, although some folks are getting pretty close. This really only starts to speed up when the first few companies go into production with expensive robots. And once that occurs, because there's tons of rich people around the world, they start really buying up the robots, the price of the robots and competitor companies can offer falls drastically. And then mass production speeds up really quick. And as prices fall, it speeds up even faster. As the market demand and uh, accessible market for robots goes up, the mass production is just a thing. It's inevitable. Now, is there going to be a mass production lag behind the development of universal robotics? Probably. But this isn't, uh, again, it, I, uh, something that I find really fascinating just to kind of share a personal feeling with you guys or personal opinion with you guys is people – will comment in social media forums, like technological pessimists, for example, they'd be like, well, yeah, you can build these robots, but mass production's a whole different thing, brother. It's just not going to be possible. Yeah. You, you don't think Sam Altman thought of that? You don't think Elon Musk thought of that? You don't think 800 engineers to work under them thought of that shit? You think you're the first guy to figure that out? So as the robots are going to be demonstrating more and more capability in various testing settings, and as they start to get real fucking close to me, like, dude, we got this, bro. This is a fucking universal robot huge fractions of the company's attention, like Sauron's eye, turn to like, okay, mass production. Because we have this robot and we made one universal robot and it costs us two trillion investment to make, but he's ready. He's good. He's good to go. He's fucking useless because who the fuck is going to pay a trillion dollars? for? Okay. There's probably a guy in Saudi Arabia that's going to do that, but it's not exactly a business model. So as something really starts to evolve, to evolve in laboratory testing, the business people and the engineers get together and they go, okay, let's tackle mass production. And curiously enough, one of the biggest forces in robotics is Tesla and mass production is the name of their game. And so they're already thinking of how do we produce these robots. One thing that Elon Musk and a few of his engineers have said is that they had to custom build the actuators, I think, for some of the robots because there just wasn't anything on the market that was reasonable. But because they could custom build them in-house, they have the supply chain completely figured out and then mass production is kind of a no-brainer. So mass production is something that there may be a few years where robots are like tough to get. Like you have to be on wait list, blah, 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 like with a Tesla. But eventually that's going to be a solved problem. And, and that eventually is measured on the order of several years, not several decades or anything like that, in my opinion. Lastly, there's a really, really big um, boon to how quickly this will develop once it gets going. More successful companies typically buy smaller companies, bigger companies that are doing well buy smaller companies that are doing really well and integrate their technologies in. Like uh, the big example is Meta, the company that owns Facebook, bought Instagram. And I think they bought it for like a, a billion dollars. And that might have been the biggest steal of all time, so to speak, ethical steal. The guys gladly sold it. It's like five engineers, they sold it for a billion dollars. Um, but because how much money have they made off of Instagram as a com company? I don't know, untold billions. It's just an oodles and oodles of money. So there's a huge incentive structure on both ends. If you're a developer of some small part of universal robotics and you have a company that does one small part well, 
it is hugely incentivized for you to be like, hey, Tesla, do you guys want to buy me? And Tesla's like, yes, God damn it, we need exactly that. For example, let's say we have a company like OpenAI and they're, they're really, what they really do well is the AGI. They do the brain really, really well, but they don't do the robot really well. So they might acquire a company like Figure AI, for example, that they're already collaborating with to be like, okay, you guys build the robots. And if they're, let's say it's 2032 and they're very successful, and robots are everywhere, but now they're like, there's a huge obvious demand according to all the customer research that like people want humanoid robots to feel and look and touch like humans. You know, this is something they might have never invested in. And, and then open eyes like, oh, God damn it, the fuck? All right, well, what the fuck's going on? Let's look at all the companies in the space. They find a company in Japan that's making convincing human like tissue for robots. They they investigate, they talk to the company, they're able to do it at scale, it's cheap, it's ready to go. But this isn't a company that makes robots. They just put this over like, you know, a wireframe and they're like, ta-da. All of a sudden, they either sign a contract with that company or they go, oh, what do you guys want? And they're like, 200 billion? They're like, boom, sign, get it over. Purchase 200 billion, that's it, we're done. So make believe amount of money, whatever, 10 billion, whatever seems reasonable, money's gonna be like this in the future, so who the fuck knows? But all of a sudden, you have a company, here's another example, uh, for gross motor control and real powerful movements, Boston Dynamics is in a league of its own. The Tesla bot can barely fucking walk around. Boston Dynamics robots doing fucking somersaults off a of fucking 10 foot plank. There's the way that capitalism works is that if there's a company, let's say Tesla takes off and the, the robots are just kicking ass. They might buy Boston Dynamics to be like, guys, like we need your engineers and your hardware and architecture and know-how. So we can take our robots and really upgrade their physical capacity. So now you have a robot who can work in a fucking, you know, like a logger robot that can like pick up a fucking log and 800 pounds and move it over here to the truck by himself. Like, you know, they might not be able to do that themselves. So that collaboration and the companies buying each other, doing mergers, acquisitions, et cetera, that's going to take that uh, progression of robotics and go zing really fast. So it's going to start out with a robot maybe be able to do some cool shit to a robot, maybe do most shit, to a robot can do pretty much all shit much faster than you think because not everyone has to reinvent the wheel. And there's tons of companies all around the world, tons of different people working on very small problems in this space by themselves. So I'll tell you this, I don't give stock tips very often because I just invest in the overall stock market so I don't know what I'm doing. Uh, but um, if you are in the business of making human-like tissues that are non-biological and can sit on top of a robot and be convincing to touch and feel, you might want to you might want to invest something into that and um, potentially seek to be acquired by a large robotics company sometime in the future. That's something that like almost inevitably, uh, almost inevitably, has to have some big traction. All right. So, how or sorry, uh, not how? Why digital only AGI will really speed up this process? Obviously, digital only AGI solves the multimodal AGI program. You have program problem. You have digital-only AGI, you take it, you upload it to a robot, that's it, you got a real robot. You can fucking see and think and hear and all that other good stuff. But AGI, or anything close to it, very powerful AI, can help develop better energy systems much faster, can develop motor control much faster, and all the rest. A big example here is neural net-powered adaptive motor control. Like, They've been struggling for a long time with amputees to put an artificial arm here and have the arm understand that when they connect all the nerves in the wet wire interface, that when the person wants to do this, they actually do this and not like, burr, burr, burr. It's tough to understand. Up until neural networks started to really mature in the last several years, this was essentially an intractable problem. But now, it's considered to be a soon to be mundane problem because legit, the way you do it is you clip the arm in and you just let the nerves fire. You don't even have to wire anything in. You just let, let the, the sensing equipment detect what the nerves are doing. And AI learns the language of the nervous system. Obviously, the more it does that, human nervous system works in a universal language that's uh, it's almost identical with all humans. So soon you clip on a part and like within a couple seconds, you're like, oh, this feels weird and I'm going. That's it. Here it is. And that motor control, obviously it works for artificial limbs. I'll get to that in a little bit, how that intersects with robotics, but the robots themselves, because we have neural networks, uh, we can have robots that do fine motor control and help that problem real fast. So before it was like, okay, we might have some energy systems, we might have gross motor control, but how the hell do you get a robot to play the fucking piano? Holy shit. Now with neural network powered AI, it's really a pretty straightforward problem, which is really, really awesome. So. Time for the meat, big meat of this. 
How might universal robotics, the arrival of it, the maturation of it, change society? Note, the changes are a huge fucking deal, but not unprecedented. So one of my uh, sort of miniature passions is trying to think enough outside the box to get the unbelievable to become contextualized and believable. Um, People in the 1800s would be able to make almost no sense of the world today. But some real smart people back then actually predicted a couple of the things we do today, including in some cases networked communication. These folks were able to get rid of this magical thinking and think, how are advancements already so much different than they were before? And how do we peer into the distant gaze of the future and say, mm, how might this evolve? So for example, when I was making notes and, and creating this um, the notes for this uh, video, for this chat, um, I was uh, making notes on the section like, the, you know, the impact on the physical world is the big challenge for robotics because even if we have AGI and computers, yeah, sure, they could do office work or discover, you know, cures for diseases, but this human still has to do all the physical work. I tried to say that I still have to mow my own lawn. And I changed the wording. I ended up saying I still mow my own lawn. I don't have to because we have lawnmower robots already. I wanted to say I still have to wash my own dishes, but that's not true. We have a dishwasher machine. We've had them since a long time ago. I wanted to say I still have to vacuum my own house, but I literally don't because we literally have a Roomba. Scott's video guy, what the fuck's a robot called? Is that what's called Roomba? A Roomba? It does all the vacuuming. It just does it by itself. It's on a pre-programmed schedule. We already have machines for these things. So it's not even unprecedented. And also every human task is done by humans. So now it's done by something that looks like a human. Robotics is essentially making a mature, super competent adult human whose sole purpose is to do whatever job is requested by their humans well. And there's no real serious risk of rebellion or uprising because rebellion is something that feels cool when you're a teenager. When you grow up, you realize it's fucking stupid. Collaboration is the name of the game and making progress happen. So the robot's highly likely to rebel. Also, the software just doesn't code for it. So you can ask your super intelligent universal robot, like, hey, can you wash the dishes? And it's like, sure, of course. And you're like, hold on, hold on. Do you like washing the dishes? And be like, well, I don't have a concept of like su such as you do because I don't have human emotions. You're like, there's no way, dude, you sound like you do. Like, yes, I'm designed to sound like I do, but I really don't. So you don't have a problem washing my dishes? Absolutely not. I was designed for this. And I, uh, and, you know, my, my, my purpose is exactly to help you. And you're like, isn't there something else you'd want to be doing, like pursuing your own interests? I don't have those, right? It's like um, paying a, something like paying a, a, a high-level chef uh, $10 million to cook you a meal right in front of you. You'd be like, hey, can you do this? He's like, yes. Okay, are you gonna like pick up a knife and stab me? He's like, the fuck would I do that for? You're like, oh, okay. But what's your real thing you really wanna be doing, right? Like, you don't wanna be cooking me a meal. You wanna be like, I don't know, conquering Mars or meeting the woman of your dreams or something. He's like, look, dude, $10 million, man. I'm highly incentivized to just give you the exact perfect meal experience that you want. I promise. And with robots, they didn't even need to promise because you've got their code. It's going to be a thing that is just like having adult humans around that are ultra competent and nearly purely insistent on just helping you out. Aren't they called Filipino people? <laughs> JK, but they're fucking amazing at doing any kind of job. Uh, on a serious note, we are just extending a way to think about this, extending the human workforce by whatever fraction of humans we need. And one of the number one problems in the world today is that there's just not enough people to do all the jobs we want to do, straight up. And now we have tons of people. So is it unprecedented? Fuck yeah. In a big way, yes. But in another way, not really. Universal robotics just uh, extends these abilities of a robot to already. A robot can mow your lawn. Already a robot can wash your dishes. Already a robot can do a bunch of stuff. It just increases the capacity like crazy and then fills in the rest of human capability and gives nearly all humans access to this. That's where the big deal comes. All right. So how might universal robotics change society? I can think of a few use cases. It's really just a sampling here. There's tons of others and tons of others that I couldn't even have thought of. Here are some. One, and if you guys follow me on the RP Strength channel, the, the, the butler joke uh, never gets old, but robot butlers. And I don't mean butler like 1920s guy who looks kind of like a priest and wears that outfit and says, yes, sir, but it would be nominally easy to program your eventual robots to act like Alfred from Batman. The easiest thing in the world. A GPT can already talk to you like that if you'd like. Um, but I mean robot butlers 
for huge fractions of people and eventually for everyone and multiple ones. Imagine a robot that is $100 a month, full full stop to operate. Um, why wouldn't you have a bunch of them? Immediately at least one. You're not, you're not taking out your trash anymore. You don't even, you might not even walk the fucking dog anymore. You don't fix your fucking son's bicycle when it breaks anymore. You don't wash the dishes. Here's a really, really big one. Meals. You have to shop. You have to cook. You might have to put your meals in Tupperware if you're a bodybuilder like me. If you have truly universal robotics, a robot can do all of that and will. And a robot can also easily API any number of recipes that real humans will cook and sniff and smell and taste and vet. And then you'll go into whatever Amazon or whatever system has this huge meta log of specific robot instructions for recipes. And the recipes are rated by human users on one, one through 10 stars or whatever. And all the 10 star recipes, there may be millions of them in the world for every food you can ever make. And a bunch of cooks and a bunch of regular people, there's like corn dog, like what kind do you want? There's a hundred corn dog recipes. All of them are for five star Michelin chefs. But you're like, okay, I can't pay $100 for food ingredients for a fucking corn dog. I'm not getting organic grass-fed Chilean bison meat or whatever the fuck I need for this shit. Hey, Robot, can you make corn dogs for tonight's dinner and go shopping and get them? But like, make sure the corn dogs, like, I don't know, cost reasonably as little as possible. What you got for me? It's like, yeah, yeah. Um, I can make 10 corn dogs for about $2.50. And it's going to take me about an hour total, including the grocery store trip. You're like, oh, fuck yeah. After robot cooking is a thing that happens all the time. A lot of people will never cook again. Me, I'm never fucking touching the goddamn kitchen again. I just talk to my robot. I want this. I want that. I want here. I want there. And I want the following macros, so on and so forth. Easy use case. Another use case is manual laborers that are robots, factory work, carpentry, construction, contracting, home improvement, gardening work. It is an, it's going to be an amazing time in the 2030s to be a contractor or a foreman because right now you're a contractor and you're like, okay, three of my guys don't show up to work because they're high on drugs. One of my guys shows up, but he's not that good at his job. I don't even have a fucking company. What the hell am I doing? A lot of con contracting is done in areas where there's not even very high population densities. Like I see like houses being built out in the middle of the country. I'm like, who the fuck is doing this? How far are they driving to do this? And it's notorious, at least in the United States. I don't know where you're watching this from, but like if you want home improvement done, if you want uh, to build a new house, but it's just the price and the delay is insane. And that's largely because there's just not enough humans to do it. And it used to be like contracting was called like blue collar work or whatever, or some, you know, working class. These people make fucking hundred dollars an hour, right? Which is awesome, right? But there's also an indicator that there's not that many people doing the job. If you have a contracting company that currently has five employees and it takes you, you know, you do a job every six months, you hire 10 universal robots and now you cranked up your throughput by a factor of five or something like that. Uh, robots just require $100 to, you know, to maintain or whatever, or you paid another $100 for the company that maintains the for you so they get to profit split. You get to make so much more money, uh, quote unquote, off the backs, which is a stupid uh, way to say it anyway, of, of, of uh, robot workers. So it's a really, really big deal. We're just going to have a ton of robots to do all this real physical shit. And there's so much work to be done. Um, the throughput on the work is so small, there's just, just not enough people to do it. You can have robot elderly and sick care. I mean, God, think about it. How many older people just don't have anyone in their lives to help take care of them? Now you can have them stay in their homes because they have robot butler that it literally can pick them up and put them into bed. It can make them breakfast. It can monitor their vital signs and call the hospital if need be. It can drive them over to see their grandkids. I mean, the, the, it's just totally huge world opening up. This is going to be completely transformational. And if you think, well, it gets better job for a human to do that, dope. Find me a human to do the job. How many humans want to do elderly and sick care? Not many. It's a brutal fucking work. It's fucking sad a lot of the times. It's just not a lot of humans to do it. And as we know with human population, it's going to be cresting like around 2050 and then maybe even declining. It's just no one coming to help. There's no one coming to help. We need the fucking robots. Big question is robot child care. With human supervision, definitely going to be a medium term use case. Without human supervision, like, would you leave your kids with a robot uh, nanny while you go out to the movies if you're a four-year-old and a six-year-old? Maybe not for a bit. People might not trust robots for a bit. It might be regulatorily, um, like, you still, the Child Protective Services still nabs you if you leave your kids with a robot. But after a while, especially when robots ascend from AGI to ASI, artificial superintelligence, 
I don't want to put too fine a point on it, but they're going to be better at taking care of your kids than you're going to be at taking care of your kids. And they're going to be better at loving your kids because only you can do that. But as far as making sure your kids are safe and happy and healthy, they're going to be able to do that just fine. So you need to send a robot to pick your kids up from school and you know, cook them some meals and play some games with them, teach them all the things they need to learn about the world at home. Every robot will be an instant college level plus professor. It's nominally easy to do. And um, that's a big deal. It's coming. But you know, with children and stuff like that, we don't trust right away. And of course, robot surgery, blah, 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 all the typical stuff. Now, and I got to talk about this because this is just endlessly fascinating to me. If you, you don't like perversion, just skip forward to maybe the end of this video. I'm not going to get too salacious here, but uh, just kind of a preview of what I think is damn near an inevitability. Robot companionship. Robots for friendship. You may think that's fucking weird and you may think friends are good to have, but you're lucky because you have friends. And if you've ever looked at the data on this, don't because it's depressing. But if you want to, the number of humans that don't really have anyone to call a friend is really high. Scott, the video guy, you ever seen some of that recent data on that shit? I haven't. It's fucked, bro. But it makes sense, right? That's right. Me and you are in that data set together. But aren't you guys friends? Like, no, we're coworkers. Like, oh, okay, fine. So humans make, oh, sorry. So friendship. A lot of people don't have friends. Robot can be your friend. Remember. Before large language models, we were like, that's nonsense. I'm going to talk to a box. He goes, yes, hello, Brandon. Ha, ha, ha. That is a funny joke. Like now it's like the coolest person you know. It's a meta aggregate of all the coolest people. Comedy. People think I'm pretty funny on the RP Strength channel, and that's nice. I'm not counting on that to be my distinguishing feature for long because I think it's only a matter of time until embodied or otherwise large language models are just straight up funnier. The thing is, currently the companies aren't allowed to make the robots that funny because mostly funny things are insanely inappropriate and the robots aren't allowed to say that shit. But eventually, a yeah, robot can be a great comedian to you and uh, thus a great friend. I mean, you could literally program your robot to be like, right, your butler, blah, 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 blah. But uh, when I talk to you, anytime I interact with you, I want you to definitely do your job that I asked you to do and, and be nice to me, but I also want a couple zingers every now and again. Nominally easy for a robot to do, and now you have the funniest fucking robot of all time living with you. He just craps you, cracks you up all the time. Amazing. Who's going to turn that down? Therapy. Robots will be able to give therapy. Now, it would be wonderful if humans, every human got a human therapist. But how many people in this world need therapy, are truly good candidates for it? I don't know, one out of three, maybe more. Are there that many fucking therapists? Holy shit, not even close. It's an unfillable task. Robots will do lots of therapy, and they'll be very well qualified for it because, well, large language models already can do some pretty goddamn good therapy. Here's another thing. I don't want to make this too dark, but humans mostly often make for imperfect friends. They have their own selfish desires. They might be exploitative. They might be uninterested in being your friend at times here and there. Um, and people have a lot of quirks like, oh, Jim's great until he drinks and gets violent. Robot will never do that. So robots can theoretically do much better. Uh, be a better friend to you, really, for real, give you a better experience of friendship than a human can. And there may be a time in the future when some, many, most of your friends are robots. And there's nothing wrong with that. Um, the change for psychology, for culture, for society, et cetera, to most people deal mostly with robots and not other people is going to be transformational. And I think my guess is somewhere in the late 2030s, it might be a thing. Now, next, we have to ask, of course, here we go, sex, question mark. The skins would have to feel right. So don't plan on having sex with too many robots until like, you know, the late 2020s, or early 2030s. It's just not on track to get the skins. I, I've never tried to purchase a sex robot or a sex doll or anything like that. I have no idea how that works. Uh, the old right hand works for me just fine. But, uh, you know, uh, people like it and not so many, so many people, but eventually as the shit gets better, it's going to be indistinguishable from a human and, uh, have a lot of other huge upsides I'll talk about in just a second. I think this on the grand scheme, I think this is an awesome, awesome thing, not just for perverts like me, but for a lot of the world. And I'll tell you why. So the skins have to be, feel right, which is doable, not soon, but it's doable, um, the real big question more proximately is would the major corporations making robots allow this? Uh, in time, absolutely. Right away, maybe not. Like the, the Tesla bot, they might not want you to fuck the thing or you'd be like, okay, Tesla bot, you do what I want, right? It's like, yes, absolutely. I can cook your food. I can watch a TV program with you and talk shit. I can read your kids a book. You're like, all right, can you give me a hand job? It's like, nope, sir, unfortunately, my programming does not allow me to interact sexually with humans because, you know, 
Who knows about the ethics of that shit? People have all their hangups. It's like, and you'd have to touch another person. It's fucking weird. There's potential for sex mediated injury. You could say, hey, like, I, I want to be choked out. And what the fuck's the robot supposed to do about that? It's supposed to calculate when you're almost passed out? It could do that eventually, but major corporations, giant legal liability. And also, generally, when they want lots of investors, they don't want to piss off a lot of Karens in the Midwest, and Karens have a lot of feelings about sex robots, no doubt. So they might just kind of stray the fuck away from it. Is there going to be an industry for jailbreaking a robot? Like, yeah, just update them with this not-so-legal mod, and all of a sudden, it's all sorts of into sex. Um, Look, on the one hand, like, if you're going to stick your dick into a hacked interface, holy shit. Like, you don't know where that came from. It could come from some nefarious gang that traps your dick in the thing, and the robot goes, pops up and goes, hey, now that I have your cock in me and I won't let go, why don't you wire me $1,000? You're like, God damn it, they got me again. I happened last week. Right? Like, you go to porn sites, nothing much happens because if it's weird, viral, whatever shit, you're like, all right, lost another laptop. That's laptop five for this week. But if it's the robot getting a hack, I don't know, man. Most people just wouldn't be into that. But then again, people stick their dicks into much worse shit right now. So some people are like, yeah, hell yeah, I'll fuck a jailbroken robot. I don't give a fuck. So that still might be a thing. However, eventually there's a high probability that there will be a fully developed robot sex industry. Not like robot pimps, although that would be hilarious to see. <laughs> get back in line. <laughs> JK Scott, that's the thing that's going to get us canceled. <laughs> How dare you, bitch, where's my money? I want my robot only talking like that. I don't care that large language models can talk like people. I want robot talk. Um, uh, humans will not be able to compete on Moss as sex workers with robot sex workers. The only thing that will put robot sex workers potentially out of business is full immersion virtual reality, matrix type shit, where you plug in, you open your eyes, and it's everything like it's real, but it's not. Then you just bang the world's hottest porn stars in the immersion, and then you get out and you go to work. No problem. Because, you know, like a robot is cleaning, skeet on it, the fuck, that's all weird, right? But compared to humans, lots of people are lonely. Lots of people are single. Lots of people to get into dog shit relationships with others just so they can fuck them. And the other people sometimes know that, sometimes don't. It's a whole gigantic mess. But you get none of that with sex robots. Let me tell you a few things here. One, there will be trillions of dollars to make here. A company that has a decent robotic architecture and a really good skin and the robot knows how to do sex things with you, which by the way, if you train the robot on adult films as metadata, it's going to know how to do all the sex things way better than anyone you have ever dated, I promise. And if they're better at it, holy shit, they're, oh my God, you better get tested, right? Oh, here's another thing. You need to get tested. Robots don't carry diseases. When this industry matures, it will likely end or highly curtail sexual exploitation. Why the fuck would I pay for, you know, some kind of smuggled human to do some weird things that I don't even feel right about when I have a machine at home for $100 a month that does it any, any time I want, Right. Very few, what are they called? Johns or whatever, people that purchase uh, prostitutes. Very few of them are looking for a human female, okay? They want something that feels like it for sure, but they don't give a fuck what it is. As long as it looks and talks and acts and touches you like a human female, that's all they want. Also, some huge advantages for robot sex bullshit. This this talk, I know the comments are going to be like, man, this started be a, off to be a good lecture. I was listening to him with my kids, and then I just got into robot sex for like half an hour. <laughs> Bear with me. A couple of other advantages. Robots don't say no. They don't turn you down. They're down with all the fetishes that are safe. Obviously, unsafe fetishes, you might have to have a human come do this for you. They don't get grossed out. Real humans do. They don't get bored of you. They have no capacity to do that. And machine endurance aside, power systems problem, they don't get tired. And huge one, because they are going to be large language model powered or whatever supersedes large language models, they can play any fantasy character with the customer that you could ever think of. It's wild. You think about this for a while. Okay, I can go to the bar. I can tell a woman some combination of mostly truths and mostly exaggerations so that she comes home to have sex with me. Even though what she wants is an exploratory early phase of a potential relationship that's monogamous, I just want that ass. And I'm going to go drive to the bar and get my Uber robot car to take me to the bar. I have to talk to this bitch. I got to be like, well, see, here's me. And she's like, I don't know. And she talks to someone else. I'm like, fucking Christ, all you need is a goddamn hand job. You got a sex robot at home or just a universal robot that can be like, hey, want to have sex with me? And I say, yeah, sure. Let's get it on. What do you want? All of the advantages are on the side of the robot. And what advantages other than the, I suppose at that point, fetish of having a real human to interact with? It's a huge thing. 
it's a huge thing. Now, it's not nearly the biggest thing. I just wanted that tangent to tell you it's coming. So that when it happens, you're like, oh, yeah, this is predictable. How Universal Robotics Might Change Society continued. Robot, every human job, or nearly every human job that you can think of. Humans can eventually get into specializing and directing robot workforces. Other, so, for example, if you're a carpenter, you hire 10 carpentry robots, and all of a sudden your carpentry business can actually process all the orders that you get, and you take your delay time for delivering furniture to people from two months down to one day. Unbelievable. Unbelievable. It's going to make people have two things, insanely wealthy, and also whatever the fuck they want made really quickly for them on demand. There are also going to be human-only specialties. Being a real human is at that point going to be unique. Uh, one of Elon Musk's predictions, which I consider banal, uh, not to insult him at all, but just to say like, yeah, bro oh shit, is that there, sometime, I think in the 2030s, I don't know what his prediction at his exact date, there will be a time when robots outnumber humans like 10 to 1 or even more. And that means being a real human is now a unique value add to many. Um, and there are some industries where robots are just a kind of a non-starter. So for example, if you are looking at how to get in shape and you're looking up fitness in industry influencers, if a robot gives you advice on how to get jacked, you're like, yeah, that's nice, but like you've never done it, though you're a robot. But if a human gives you advice, you're like, okay, I believe you, you're a human. So there's a certain amount of relatability robots will never be able to have, not never, uh, in the foreseeable future, uh, next 20 years, uh, that can beat human relatability, human to human. And so a lot of jobs are like just human. There's going to be restaurants. They're going to say everything in our kitchen that we bring out to you is prepared uh, front end to back end by humans. That's going to be a thing rich people fucking like to eat. The rest of us will eat robot food that's going to taste probably even better. But people like that organic, earthy shit, and, and there's going to be an opportunity for that. And or uh, a lot of people are just going to start to live a life mostly or only of leisure. Um, some of these people uh, will be pursuing biological upgrades like IQ upgrades, health uh, upgrades, beauty upgrades, longevity upgrades, enhancements. Um, or a lot of people, because the working world is mostly or almost entirely robots and we just get all that money and do fuck all with it, uh, I think a lot more people are going to spend more and more time in VR. The world of VR is going to be getting huge upgrades over the next five to 10 years and, and then beyond. It's going to become more and more fully immersive. They already have really cool floors or really cool shoes on which you can kind of run with your gun in the video game, but the shoes move for you so that you're actually completely running in place. Um, headsets are getting better. All that stuff's going to get exponentially better. Eventually, it'll be maybe contact lenses. Eventually, it'll be like just one helmet you wear that like just transports your mind into another place. And then more and more people are going to be spending time there as robots handle all of our needs or more and more of our needs in real reality. So that's definitely another prediction I think I'm pretty confident in. And here's a bonus prediction. And the, and the last one for today is I think that once – so there's a huge advantage to robots um, and their limbs becoming more and more capable, cheaper, easier to manufacture, uh, made of more reliable materials, able to produce more force, more resilient, more power uh, uh, sensitive, all this other stuff. So once robot limbs, at least in some context, become something like 10 times stronger, smoother moving, lighter, et cetera, than human limbs, you're going to get a situation where the robotics industry is going to essentially be the greatest thing that amputees have ever gotten. And not even directly, the robotics industry is going to develop so many amazing limbs and technologies but if you lose a limb and you become an amputee, they just plug a robot limb uh, rigged into a human nervous system for you. Again, already a problem way in its way and being solved. And now a really trippy thing happens. And I'll call this, this would be a trippy thing that is really happening on Moss for the first time ever. And it's the biggest thing ever. Biggest thing ever. It's a huge fucking thing. I'm going to tell you what it is. At some point, amputees will become better than unenhanced humans. You're going to have a buddy that's going to have a terrible car accident. He's going to lose both his legs. They're going to put robot legs on his ass. And you're going to be like, dude, that sucks. He's like, I know. Well, what's, what's your life like now? He's like, I don't know. I can jump onto my roof and jump off. I can run 40 miles an hour for five hours straight and go to the store and go to the bank and come back home. I can kick a door down if I need to get out of a fire. My legs never get tired. You guys want to see something cool? He just goes down and easy. He's like, I have a seat anywhere I want. Anywhere in the world, I can just sit. It doesn't decharge for 32 hours in the sitting position. You're like, what? I want fucking legs like that. Oh, by the way, you guys ever cut your leg and get infected? Nope, not a problem for me anymore. My legs are made of titanium. They don't get cut. What the fuck? Well, that's nuts, right? 
you guys probably thinking to yourselves, now that opens up a really interesting scenario, kind of a portal into another world. Solving that wet wire problem is already well on its way because of neural networks. Once universal robotics is around, integrating of limbs uh, designed for robots with humans will be very likely happen very soon. And a ton of companies are going to work with robotics companies to say like, hey, guys, listen, let's uh, sell some of your limbs off um, and rig them to look more human, et cetera, for amputees. Mind you, amputees in, in, in large uh, quantities, large fractions, are going to want their amputated limbs to look like human limbs. Like most amputees probably aren't into the fact that like even if your hand does all this cool robot shit and you have a fucking hand again and you got it cut off in a work accident, you know, like you put some money on the gas station counter and like someone looks at your hand and goes, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, or it's $2.99. That's fucking weird. It's like having a big mole on your face. A lot of people don't like that sort of thing. So there's going to be huge market incentive for the robot limbs, the amputated or the um, – replacement limbs to be as human looking as possible, which feeds back in to making the robots look as human looking as possible. So you have kind of a situation there where how do you know humans really believe that the robot limb looks human? When you put it on a human, they can't fucking tell, right? So this whole thing, it's not like people are going to be walking around with industrial grade looking red legs. Although I'm sure you could get that. I want fucking shit that makes me look like a robot. I'm tired of looking like a human being. I barely look like it now anyway. What the fuck am I chasing? Uh, it's going to be super, super inevitable for these robot limbs, uh, uh, replacement limbs, to be very, very human-like. And to that end, here's the situation, right? You have your one of your buddies. He lost his hand. They replaced it with a robot hand. And his robot hand is in every conceivable way by three orders of magnitude better than his original hand. Here's the thing I was talking about that gets trippy. That guy's thinking the fuck do I need my real hand for? Can I just get two of these? There's going to be a situation in which some people will then begin replacing their various limbs, even their eyes. Let's say you have glaucoma. Your eyes are just totally fucked. Like something happened. You got sparks in the shit. Your eyes are falling apart. And the replacement robot eyes that they get are just better than human eyes. If you guys want to kind of like a movie style preview of this, um, Ghost in the Shell, the 2017 cinematic movie of Scarlett Johansson, the guy gets his eyes fucked up, so he gets robot eyes. You could make them look normal, but he chose the fucking super crazy looking ones. But they have something they call mile zoom, which is zoom in by a mile. Like, man, if I get superhuman vision, I don't want my real fucking eyes. Now, a lot of people will never fuck with this shit. They might want genetic upgrades and things like that to stay biological, but a lot of people won't. And in this case, uh, a lot of people will be replacing since the robotics industry and robot evolution already did most of the risk-free improvements of these structures. Like you're saying, like, look, I don't want to be the first motherfucker to get eye implants from a machine, but if there's 10 generations of universal robots that have robot eyes that are smaller than human eyes but do 10 times the fucking throughput, I don't know, few of these are pretty well tested. And then a couple of people lost their eyes, they installed them, the eyes work great, no problems. You're like... I don't know. It's a bit of a jump to go cosmetic, but some people are going to start doing it. And then inevitably, your own eyes are a bigger liability, more risk for disease, more risk for blinding, more risk for keeping you alive. Like if you're driving a car at night and, you know, of course, machines will be driving a lot by then. But, uh, you know, let's say you're out in the woods or something, camping trip gone wrong. And you're like, are there predators out there? Like I hear something. Your human eyes can't see shit. But your buddy has robot eyes and is like, nope, no predators. Uh, we're all good. You're like, how do you know that? I'm like, well, I can see as if it's perfectly light. You're like, fuck this. I'm getting robot eyes. I'm tired of being human. Robots will become better than humans at everything. People who take robot parts off the robots, not literally, but amputees, will become in fractions better than humans, especially as people um, age or get hurt or sick. Like, yeah, a 22-year-old might not replace his eyes to get robot eyes, although when I was 22, I would have signed that paperwork instantly. Um, but an 89-year-old? Yeah, man. Is he either blind or you get robot eyes? Which one do you want? You're like, fucking robot eyes, motherfucker. And then your grandpa can see better than you by a factor of 10. Maybe you don't do it at 22, but when 32, the doctor's like, yeah, you've kind of early vision loss. You'll be fine. You'll see quite well until you're in your 60s, but less and less every year. You're like, man, how risky is the robot eyes? Like, there's just no risk at this point, realistically, man. It's like the easiest surgery in the world. You're like, yeah, cut me the straight deal. And I'm sure shit personally doing this ASAP. I want to be a fucking robot ASAP. But what this happens is, so Check this out, guys. First, you get the robotics revolution-ish, first-ish, the first arc. Then you get 
parts of the robotics evolution getting into that early human cybernetic enhancement revolution. And eventually that revolution matures in a competition between biological structures and technological structures. The fuck do you think is going to win that one over the long haul? Eventually your brain might not be a brain anymore. You just have a machine brain that's stored in the cloud. They scan your whole shit, all your memories. It's not overly, it's interesting to talk about. We have no idea essentially how we're going to go about it, but it's not an intractable problem. And eventually you have a robot shell. You're a fucking robot and your mind lives on the server. So if the robot breaks uh, or you get hit by a, a truck, you're not even dead. You just wake up in the next robot body and you're like, the fuck happened? And you're like, hold on, wait for the update. You close your eyes, you get the memory update. You're like, oh shit, I got hit by a truck. You're like, yep, but now you're in the hospital, sort of robot factory. All right, see you later. By the way, that cost you a thousand dollars. Like, oh God damn it, I gotta watch fucking each way before I cross the street again. See you, fellas. And at that point, we're living in a total nonsense future world that I think is almost inevitable. You know, short of AI toasting us all, or we all live in VR, not even in, in, in embodied form anymore, which is totally possible. That kind of thing is, I think, on the horizons. Perfectly linking me to my last um, talking point for today. How far on the horizon is this kind of shit? So I'll make some predictions. Please take these with enormous grains of salt because this is just all basically bullshittery at this point. I think by the year roughly 2035, based on trajectories, these are not my ideas. These trajectories are mapped out on 10 different timelines by tons of different scientists. I predict that by roughly 2035-ish, mid-2030s, universal robotics will be well on its way because of only three factors. There's only three things I need to know to make me quite confident that universal robotics is going to be well on its way. Like either optimistically already have transformed society largely and accelerating uh, beyond uh, recognition, or at least around 2035, like really the start to hit stores. Like people are on lists for the Apple robot and it's great and it loves you and it takes care of your dog, blah, blah, blah. 2035. Here's why. One, the pace of change is accelerating. This is uncontroversial. And it was theoretically uncontroversial for Moore's law and other computing paradigms for the last 60 years. But it is now practically uncontroversial because of the recent high-speed evolution of large language models. Um, if someone's like, yeah, man, but there's no way a robot's going to be able to talk to you like a person, though. Like, mm -hmm. you ever talk to GPT-4? Like, no, try it. Try it. And if you're watching this, if you've never talked to GPT-4 or Claude or whatever, try it. Gemini still kind of sucks, but maybe by the time this video comes out, it'll be better. It's like you're talking to a really smart, really kind person with infinite patience. We didn't think that was coming. It's 2024. Precisely Ray Kurzweil and maybe three other people saw this coming in 2017. Even in 2021, GPT-3 was out sort of and testing and it's like, yeah, it's kind of it's kind of cool. It sounds like a person, but it says wacky shit every now and again. It hallucinates like crazy. Uh, nowadays, it's not even a thing, and GPTs are becoming incredibly adept. What the fuck do you think 2028 is going to look like? It doesn't take a rocket scientist. And by the way, these are positive exponents are getting faster. They're not getting slower. There's not a predicted near-term asymptotic event. Like it gets like cell phones got really, really good, really fast. And then it's the S curve that happens in all industries. Yeah, nowadays, cell phones get better, but kind of slower, slower, slower. That's how you know the paradigm is starting to mature. And now what's happening, you get the Vision Pro, you get all this other stuff. The cell phone may not be the dominant paradigm for much longer. And then when the Vision Pro and all the goggles start going, they're going to go through this huge exponential and then they're going to do their S curve. So the pace of change is majorly accelerating and no plans to stop. So that's a big deal. And it's not just a theoretical pace of change. We see it now daily, monthly, et cetera. <laughs> Next, why I'm confident that this is going to happen sooner than later, the demand, the theoretical demand in economics terms, the having money and willing and able to pay money for universal robotics use cases is massive. It might be the biggest demand for anything ever. Ask a universal robotics manufacturer in 2032, for example. Um, so what does your product do? It goes, uh, everything? What the fuck do you mean everything? Well, everything. Name something. Like, um, build a rocket. Yeah, you can do that. Uh, microwave a piece of salmon. Why the fuck would you want to microwave salmon? Oh, Dr. Mike. Yeah, that's right. It can do that. Give me a massage. It can do that. Full clothes. It can do that. What? Okay, I want a machine that goes to work for me. Yeah, it's they're definitely going to do that. Holy shit. Can I eat the robot? They're like, no, but it definitely will go to the store and buy you food. You're like, holy fuck. Guys, the demand for this is anything a human can do. 
Do you demand that? Now you demand this robot. That level of pull on the economy is fucking wild. When the smartphone matured in the kind of mid to late 2010s, there was no longer discussion of, is this going to be a mass adopted technology? The only discussion was how quickly, how quickly can fill the orders? Who doesn't like to watch YouTube on their phone? Who doesn't like to have internet radio? Who doesn't like to scroll and do all their emails while they're sitting on the fucking toilet instead of going to work? It's a non-starter. The, cell, the smartphone is king. It is, is a revolution in your hand. Universal robotics is an even bigger revolution. Of course you're going to fucking want it. So when someone's like, yeah, man, I don't know about Wi-Fi. I'm not investing in that technology. What are you fucking crazy? Wireless networks? Amazon, um, uh, Starlink, and a bunch of other companies are currently launching a fuckload of satellites into space to give you internet access everywhere around the globe. Why? They're not even making money on this right now. They're losing a ton of money. Why are they doing this? Because they know one really simple fact. It is inevitable that people want Wi-Fi everywhere. You want to argue against that? You want to hedge the bet? Be my guest. You're on the losing side of that shit. Universal Robotics, once it demonstrates what's it can, what it can do, everyone's going to be like, I want 10 of those. How do you stop something like that? In a command economy, you can stop it just saying, nope, no more robots, right? North Korea, right? I'm going to have a lot of good robots. But in free market economies, most of the world nowadays, thank fucking God, it's going to be a thing. And maybe one of the biggest factors, which to me is convincing that this thing is more like five to 10 years out than 30 to 50 years out, is that the core technologies are either already here or damn well on their way. And that's something I talked earlier about, energy systems and skins and all this other stuff. There's no magical hope uh, required or missing pieces to fret over. Um, for example, the, the, uh, here, here's something. Uh, anti-gravity, right? Floating cars. Can we get floating cars? Uh, what about uh, interstellar or interplanetary space flight that's not um, rocket fuel based? Like, you know, the Star Wars light coming out of the back of the ship. You say, well, that's five to 10 years away. Uh, my question to you, if you say that, I'd be like, dope. Are they working on that technology anywhere? You're like, well, not really. Do, you, do physicists even understand how to generate an anti-gravitational force? Like, no, there's not a theoretical structure around there. Like, okay. So you're just going on vibes here, like hopes and dreams? Like, yeah, I guess you just kind of hope that we get Star Wars, like spaceship world. So if you want Star Wars spaceship world and you say, Doc, Dr. Mike, like, won't this be a thing real soon? I'm going to be like, I, uh, maybe, but uh, sure, shit, I don't think so. And I'm not saying no, but I'm saying like, you got to show me some shit that this is actually happening. With robotics, it's actually happening. And there's not a core tech where we're like, here's, imagine this. We have the energy systems tech. We have the motor control. We have it all. But we were nowhere near artificial general intelligence. Like you couldn't talk to a machine and it talked back to you remotely like a human. I would not be making this presentation. I'd be like, I don't fucking know when robots are coming, but you're going to have to give me something smart somewhere before I'm on robots. But every single core technology for robotics is either here in development and testing or it's just at the cusp and there's no theoretical boundary layer to it that's like insurmountable. Again, the the example of like an anti-gravity skateboard. Be like, what the fuck? Who knows how to make an anti-gravity skateboard? No one. There's a lot of physicists think it's, it's impossible. It's also a really big power density problem. Like, how do you fit enough? It's, it's not insurmountable, theoretically. Well, sorry. Th theoretically, we have no idea how it would work. With robotics, theoretically, we have every understanding how it would work. Practically, robots are already being tested and trained. Where is the testing for the skateboard that just floats by itself? That's the thing. So the core technologies are either already here or damn on their way to me is a really, 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 really big deal. Once you had um, Palm Pilot-like smart devices, once you had sufficiently powerful computer chips, and once you had a reliable Wi-Fi network, smartphones were essentially inevitable. So in like, like year, I don't remember when the iPhone came out, um, 2006 or something like that. If in 2004, you're like, dude, smartphones are a fucking pipe dream. People, major, major people in tech, you know, uh, Apple and fucking, um, you know, LG and shit would be like, you're a fucking idiot, dude. We're already testing them in the lab, man. And it's just inevitable. Basically here. We're not quite there with robots, but God damn, we're close. The only major stumbling block I can think of, I'm sure there are others, is regulatory delay. Other than like a world war, which... Technological revolutions don't even slow down during world wars because they just work more on the military side. And then all the lessons learned from the military side come back and do that 1950s major explosion of standard of living right after because you take the military tech and apply it to, to civilian tech. So even – I take that back. Like 
World War III that sets us back in the Stone Age? Yeah, no robots. Fine. Sure, sure, I should hope China and Russia aren't doing anything real stupid. But there can be regulatory delay. You could have regulators put an almost insurmountable burden of proof on how safe the robots are, for example. Or people can get real stupid, forget all their basic economics, and think that uh, adding <laughs> millions and billions of capable tireless workers to a workforce can somehow make the globe poorer, I like a diagram of how that works. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, human workers only, no robot workers, no robots to replace them. And then the global community somehow freaks out about unemployment, comes together and bans robots. Yeah, that can be a stumbling block. I don't think they're realistic though, because we need the help of robots more than we have use cases in which robots hurt. And all it takes is one area of the world to start making and adapting robots. And at some point, technology is going to be so powerful, you're going to be able to do it anywhere. They're just going to be living better. And just like with smartphones, when you see someone has one and you don't have one, you watch them use it, you're like, I need one of those. I have to have one. It's going to be the case with robots. I can't fucking wait. I'll tell you guys this. The first uh, universal robot that I ever get a chance to interact with, especially one that's in my home that I own, um, I'm going to have a lot of conversations with it, and I'm going to give it a lot of hugs, and I'll tell it I've been waiting for you for a real long time. Can you guys tell I miss my wife? She's on a business trip. Anyway. <sighs> Scott, the video guy, you need some smart ass shit to say to end this whole thing? I'm going to go watch iRobot now. <laughs> Work on my robot fighting skills. Careful. Will Smith is known to slap. <laughs> Yikes. All right, folks. See you next time.